If you would, go ahead and be making your way in your Bible uh, to 2 Samuel chapter 23. 2 Samuel chapter number 23. I pray that, uh, does everybody have a book? Most people here have a book or Sunday school material. Praise the Lord, everybody got a book. I pray that you've at least at some point in time this week, uh, maybe even glance through the material. What a true blessing that is. It's been for me and I uh, pray that uh, you guys having the material are also using that and taking that opportunity to go ahead and pre-read through the lessons. Uh, it certainly helps uh, the teacher and it certainly helps uh, us as the student as well uh, to learn through the material. So we're in lesson number four entitled uh, Dare to be a Leader. Dare to be a Leader. Uh, if you have your book there, I won't have you turn to your Bible to 1 Samuel chapter number 22, uh, verses 1 and 2. If you don't have your book, feel free to, to hold your place there in 2 Samuel and turn to 1 Samuel chapter number 22. And we're going to read verses 1 and 2. 1 Samuel chapter number 22, verses 1 and 2. David therefore departed thence and escaped to the cave Adam. And when his brethren and all his father's house heard it, they went down thither to him. And everyone that was in distress, and everyone that was in debt, and everyone that was discontented, gathered themselves unto him. And he became a captain over them, and there were with him about 400 men. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Lord, I'm so very thankful for an opportunity to be here, Lord, for another opportunity just to, to open your word and to share with everyone else what you shared with me. Father, I pray that we would each receive exactly what you had in mind. Lord, would you pen the text? Lord, would you impress my heart with the lesson? But we pray for, uh, Lord, the, the student here, Lord, we pray for each and every person, Lord, that they would receive exactly what you had in mind. Father, be with this hour. In Jesus' name, amen. So, uh, the setting here in 1 Samuel 22 Chapter number one and two, I mean, in verse one and two, uh, we see David, he's escaped. He's running. He's, he's not on vacation. He's escaped. He's running from Saul. He's fearing for his life. He has fled to a cave, a cave Adullam. Adullam, the name Adullam means refuge. It was a place of refuge. Although uh, the name of the place that David escaped to meant refuge, his real refuge was in the Lord. Amen. He was escaping to a place, but his real escape was in the Lord. Psalms 57 uh, ver verse 1 says, To the chief musician, Adashit Mishnam of David, when he fled from Saul in the cave, be merciful unto me, O God, be merciful unto me, for my soul trusteth in thee, yea, in the shadow of thy wings will I make my refuge. Unto these calamities be overpassed. David escaped Saul to a cave. He went to a place, but he knew where his real escape was. Through David's example, we learn that a godly leader will not need to demand loyalty. He'll just inspire it. A true leader doesn't have to stand before anyone and demand that they follow how genuine is your loyalty to our pastor if our pastor stands before us and says you must do exactly what i say you must follow me exactly as i instruct i think we'd see some people falling away right if if he's leading a godly life and leading in that manner then we're sure to follow through just divine inspiration, without the request, without the demand. Loyalty given on a volunteer basis will encourage the follower to be bold and accomplish much in the service of the Lord. If you've got your, your book, some of you may like to fill in those points. Some of you may have already filled them in. I know we handed out cheat sheets, but that first line there, the attraction to their leader the attraction to their leader. 1 Samuel 22, 
1 through 2. Again, says David, therefore departed thence and escaped to the cave Agilom. And when his brethren and all his father's house heard it, they went down thither to him. And everyone that was in distress and everyone that was in debt and everyone that was discontented gathered themselves unto him. And he became a captain over them. And there were with him about 400 men. When his brethren and all his father's house heard what he was going through, they just went. He didn't have to call upon them. They just went. Is this our attitude today as believers? Is that our attitude when we hear of somebody else that's in distress? Lord, help us because our initial first thought, for me, right, maybe not for you, is, well, what did they do? What could they have done differently? Sometimes we even take the attitude of, well, they made their bed. Who said that before? Praise the Lord. I guess not too many people, but I have. Right? You hear of somebody in trouble and you instantly think, what could they have done differently? How could they have gotten themselves out of that mess? When we see others in trouble, this isn't the time to sit back and watch from the sidelines. It's time, just as this lesson says, to see a need and take the lead. And Lord, help me. Lord, help me. Everything doesn't have to be organized by our pastor. Everything doesn't have to be organized by an associate pastor. Right? We, we don't have to ask permission to create a meal train for somebody. I thank God for a pastor and a pastor's wife that do things like that, that take initiative when we're in need, that stand in a pulpit and suggest that we call a brother or a sister in Christ that's down on their luck or that's in the hospital and is about to have surgery. I praise God for that. But we don't have to have that, do we? Again, Lord, help me to take more initiative, especially for those closest to us. We shouldn't have to be instructed to help others, to do things for others, to encourage others, to come alongside of others. It was based on their need. This, this group here of men, the lesson, sure it's about David and how he escaped, but the lesson is also about the mighty men that came to his side. Let's read that. Let's read uh, first, uh, 2 Samuel, excuse me, chapter number 23. 2 Samuel 23. And we're going to read verses 1 through 22. Verses 1 through 22, 2 Samuel 23. Now these be the last words of David, David the son of Jesse, and the man who was raised up on high, the anointed of God of Jacob, and the sweet psalmist of Israel said, the spirit of the Lord spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. The God of Israel said, The rock of Israel spake to me. He that ruleth over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. And he shall be as the light of the morning. When the sun riseth, even a morning without clouds, as the tender grass springeth out of the earth by clear shining after rain. Although my house be not so with God, yet he hath made with me an everlasting covenant, or ordered in all things, and sure, for this is all my salvation and all my desire, although he make it not to grow. But the sons of Belial shall be all of them as thorns thrust away, because they cannot be taken with hands. But the man that shall touch them must be fenced with iron and the staff of a spear, and they shall be utterly burned with fire in the same place. These be the names of the mighty men whom David had. The Tachamite, Tachamanite, that, said in, that sat in the seat, chief among the captains. The same as Adino the Ezanite, he lift up his spear against 800 whom he slew at one time. And after him was Eleazar, the son of Dodo, the Ahohite, one of the three mighty men with David, when they defied the Philistines that were there gathered together to battle. 
and the men of Israel were gone away. He arose and smote the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand clave under the sword. And the Lord wrought a great victory that day. And the people returned after him only to spoil. And after him was Shema, the son of Agi, the Hagarite, the Hararite. And the Philistines were gathered together into a troop where was a piece of ground full of lentils. And the people fled from the Philistines. But he stood in the midst of the ground and defended it and slew the Philistines. And the Lord wrought a great victory. And three of the thirty chief went down and came to David in the harvest time unto the cave of Adullam. And the troop of the Philistines pitched in the valley of Rephaim. And David was then in a hold, and the garrison of the Philistines was, was then in Bethlehem. And David longed and said, Oh, that one would give me drink of the water of the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. And the three mighty men break through the host of the Philistines and drew water out of the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate and took it and brought it to David. Nevertheless, he would not drink thereof. He poured it out unto the Lord. And he said, Be it far from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Is not this the blood of the men that went in jeopardy of their lives? Therefore, he would not drink it. These things did these three mighty men. And Abishai, the brother of Joab, the son of Zariah, was chief among three. And he lifted up his spear against 300 and slew them and had the name among three. Was he not most honorable of three? Therefore, he was their captain. Howbeit he attained now unto the first three. And Benaiah, the son of Jehadiah, the son of a valiant man of Kabzeel, who had done many acts. He slew two lion-like men of Moab. He went down also and slew a lion in the midst of a pit in time of snow. And he slew an Egyptian, a goodly man. And the Egyptian had a spear in his hand. But he went down to him with a staff and plucked the spear out of the Egyptian's hand and slew him with his own spear. These things did Benaiah, the son of Jehodiah, and had the name among three mighty men. We read a lot about these men, these mighty men that came to David's aid. We learn a lot about the things that they did that made them mighty. We see, first of all, that they had a need. That's your next point. It was their need that brought them to David. This group is described as mighty men. The Bible says they were in distress. They were in debt and they were discontented. They were the uh, the the misfits. I uh, think of the movie uh, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, right? The, the, the misfit toys. They were the ones that nobody wanted. That was this group. They were the ones, they weren't part of the popular crowd, right? They, they, they weren't sitting in the back of the bus with the cool kids. Okay, they were, they were the outcast. That's who these men were. But we find out that they're mighty. These mighty men needed a leader to lead them. So they started out in distress. They started out in debt. They started out discontented. Uh, but were inspired by David's leadership uh, to be the best they could be. Men of God, who are you inspiring today? I know as a father, I have three children that look up to me each and every day. I have a wife that looks to me to inspire her in the right direction to move. Who are you inspiring today? Whether you realize it or not, child of God, you have someone that is behind you watching your direction, every move you make, and they want to follow. Who are you inspiring? Do you know that you're inspiring someone? If nothing else, children of God, we can lead our children in such a manner that they become the Christian that you desire to be. I would say that's a pretty good standard to set. 
Look at yourself. What type of Christian would you like to be? And inspire your children or those that are following behind you to be that Christian. It was based on the, their leader's sufficiency. That's your next point. Sufficiency. These men knew that David would take care of them, though they were the outcasted. And they were the unwanted bunch of that day. Our success in the Christian walk is based on the sufficiency of our leader as well. Our leader being Jesus Christ. Our leader being the Lord. His sufficiency is enough for us to follow him. Because Jesus conquered death, hell, and the grave, we can be confident in the fact that we can finish our race well. Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2 says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. First Peter 5, 7 says, Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Amen. 2 Corinthians 12, 9, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities than the power of Christ, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. You understand what he's saying there? He'd rather sit in his misery with Christ than be on top of the world without. Their loyalty to their leader. Loyalty to their leader. Loyalty must be a trait of both the leader and the follower. Uh, if a relationship is to work, you have to have that trait on both sides. Right? Now, our pastor couldn't expect loyalty from his flock if he wasn't first loyal to his flock. The, the old saying, uh, you have to give respect to give respect, that works here too, right? You have to be loyal to others in order for others to be loyal to us. Hebrews 13, 17 says, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. I thank God for a godly man like our pastor that is willing to take on the responsibility of each and every soul that's involved in this flock. Do you understand that? Just as a dad, as a father, you are responsible for the souls of your family. Our pastor is responsible for our souls. It's up to him to guide us, lead us in the proper direction. You should pray daily and thank God daily for a good man uh, that does just that. We live in a day and a time where we talk about it every service for, for forever now because of the things that are going on in our world where people are falling off. I think of a great pastor uh, from, from the olden days, right? Uh, Charles Stanley, a fantastic pastor, right? Led his church, right? But made some decisions that were borderline questionable. And because of those decisions that he made, now his son is on television saying that God never demanded us to meet as a church. Defending people that are saying close the churches down. He has closed his church until the next year. That's right here in Atlanta. That's not in California. That's not New York. That's in Atlanta. You've got Kanye West meeting with Joel Osteen in Fayetteville, Georgia to walk on water. We laugh, it's funny, right? But we should thank God for the man that leads this church. Yes. Because he follows the Lord and he doesn't allow silly things to come in and change the things that don't need to be changed. Amen. They served willingly. 2 Samuel 23, verse 16. We just read in three mighty men 
break through the host of the Philistines and drew water out of the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate and took it and brought it to David. And nevertheless, he would not drink thereof, but poured it out unto the Lord. Notice how David, he never asked these three men. He didn't say, hey guys, would you mind, uh, man, I really want some water, but it's specific water. I need it from that well over there in Bethlehem. Would you mind going and getting me some water from there? He didn't do that. It's not what he did. Have, have you ever just thought, man, I'd really like to have something? And then somebody goes and gets it, right? That's what these three mighty men did for David. They risked their lives to bring David some water. Loyal followers will do anything for their leaders. All David had to do was wish for water from that well in Bethlehem. And these three men ran and risked their lives to get him just that, the water. 2 Corinthians 8, 12 says, For, for if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to to that a man hath and hath and not according to that he hath not excuse me i'm reminded of september the 11th you know we just we just passed by this uh memorial day uh, that we we don't celebrate but we certainly remember what happened every single year you know on september the 11th 343 firefighters 37 Port Authority officers, 23 New York Police Department officers, and eight paramedics all loyally followed their leaders straight into harm's way. And they paid the ultimate price with their lives. Those are just the ones that passed away that day. Countless thousands of officers and firefighters and paramedics and medical staff and just anybody else that was willing ran straight into danger's way to help. No one had to ask these people to do this. They instinctively did it. It was their loyalty. Some to their loyalty in the Lord, some to their loyalty in their job, others to loyalty in the country. Whatever it was, it was loyalty that led them into harm's way. What is it that the Lord's been burdening you with, burdening your heart with, that you're just refusing to do. You're unwilling to stand up and be loyal to what the Lord has asked you to do. Are you being loyal to the Lord? What was me, right? So the Lord called me to be a missionary, told me that I was to, to stand and preach, to stand before you, sit before you and teach. Uh, that's completely against everything that is Alan Bradley. I do not like being here. I'm sweating right now, not because it's hot, but because I'm nervous. I have to spend minutes before I come uh, and sit here or stand here or preach and just pray and ask God to take over because this is not me. I ran for a year. I told the Lord that he was wrong for a year and it was miserable. What are you running from? What is he telling you to do? Maybe it's not be a missionary. Maybe it's not be a preacher. But maybe it's the Lord's been burning your heart with telling this person about the Lord or, or doing this thing. We have to be mindful. We have to obey. We have to be loyal. These three served wholeheartedly. And just as all these mighty men did, they served wholeheartedly. 2 Samuel 23 verse 17 says, and he said, be it far from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Is not this the blood of the men that went in jeopardy of their lives? Therefore, he, he would not drink it. These things did these three mighty men. David is saying here that these men went into harm's way and risked their lives even for his desire. He just had to pay them respect and he had to thank the Lord for that. Have you ever just thought out loud how great it would be to have something? Have you ever worked outside, right? Have you ever been so hot and just stood up, not, not with the heart or desire of somebody go get me some water, but just to stand up and say, it is so hot, I would love to have some water. And then somebody goes and grabs it. 
I, I've been there. Has anybody else been there? Have you ever had anybody do anything like that for you? The immense feeling of appreciation that you have, the overwhelming uh, just thankfulness that you have. Are we willing to serve our Lord with all of our hearts? Even if you just think, right, that the Lord wants you to do something, are you willing to do it? So we like to wait for uh, the Lord to beat it into our head, right, before we're willing to respond. What would it be like if the moment that we thought the Lord was telling us to do something, we just did it? What would, what would it be like? The uh, former president, uh, Brother Don Sisk of BIMI, uh, heard him speak one day, and he was telling a story, and he, he laid it out like this. He said, so you say that God hasn't called you to be a missionary. Well, that's okay. Just go ahead and quit your job, go on deputation, and drum up support, fly to China, plant churches, and see souls saved. He said, I promise you when you get to heaven, God will forgive you. And that's not taking flippantly the call that God puts in our lives. But I think sometimes we hide in this place and we say, well, we don't really, that's not for me. Or I don't have to do that. Or I don't really have to witness to this person. That's the pastor's responsibility. In fact, hey, hey, pastor, can you come talk to this person? Right? God has called us all to that place. God has called us all to do something specific. What would it be like if the moment we felt like God was leading us in a way that we just did it? Man, what an awesome church we would be in. What an awesome community we would be in. Hey, man, you want to talk about making America great again? That would make America great again, right? When all of God's people started doing what God instructed them to do, the moment that he instructed them to do it, without sitting around like a bunch of defiant children and saying, but why? But I don't want to. But not right now. Do I have to? Lord, help us. Lord, help me. Lord, help me. Start with me. That I respond properly. Right away. When John Hancock signed the Declaration of Independence, he signed it really big. So big, in fact, that we've even heard, and I'm sure you've even said, let me get your John Hancock. We refer to John Hancock as a signature. The reason why is his signature was the biggest and the most bolsterous signature on the uh, Declaration of Independence, right? Well, why did he sign it that way? Have you ever stopped to think about the fact that the moment that those men signed that document, no matter how they signed it, the moment that they signed it, they became enemies to the King of England. Instantly, it was like putting their own name on the wanted poster. Fill in your name here. And yet John Hancock signed his big and bolsterous. Well, why? He was declaring that he didn't care. He loved what he was doing. He loved what he was doing for this country to the point that he was willing to lay down his life. How big are you willing to sign your name today on what the Lord has asked you to do? For me, a lot of times I like to write as small as I can, and it's usually in print. Lord, help me to just sign real big whenever the Lord says, hey, go do. He wanted the king to know exactly where he stood. How about you? Have you made it clear to the Lord and to everyone around you by both your words and your actions, your works, that your dedication, your commitment, and your loyalty is to the King of Kings. I've mentioned it in the pulpit when preaching before. Would I recognize you as a brother or a sister in Christ outside of church, outside of your suit, outside of your Sunday clothes, outside of your uh, Sunday attitude, right? Lord, help us. Uh, the devil and just our flesh, the, the time that it likes to give us the most trouble is on the way to church, amen. We, we get in that car and everything is wrong. There's a problem with the car. Somebody left something at home. We're running late. 
somebody's makeup's not done, somebody didn't have something, we're in a, we're in a mess. And then we pull in the church parking lot and it's, okay. And everybody puts on their smile. And everybody comes in and everything's okay. We have to be committed to showing everybody all the time that we are loyal to the King of Kings, to the Lord of Lords, to Jesus Christ. Their mightiness for their leader. Their mightiness for their leader. We see David as a mighty man that killed Goliath. David's might, however, uh, did not come from his ability to kill a giant. Uh, it came from his ability to trust in the Lord. Because of David's mightiness, he was able to attract other mighty men. These other mighty men, they were valiant. They were valiant. Valiant means possessing or showing courage or determination. 2 Samuel 21, verses 16 through 22. We won't read these for, for time's sake, but we see that Abishai, the son of Zariah, smote the Philistine Ishbi Mino, one of the sons of the giant. We also see uh, Elhanan, the son of Jari Orishim, a Bethlehemite, that slew the brother of Goliath. We see Jonathan, the son of Shemaiah, Shemaiah, the brother of David, slew the six-fingered and six-toed son of Goliath. All three of these men accomplished feats that seemed unrealistic. They happened. Just like David killed Goliath, these three killed relatives of the giant. We see more examples of uh, men with valor, mighty men with valor from our text today. Abishai, who killed a giant and uh, took 300 enemy by himself. He took on 300 enemy by himself. Benaiah, uh, who slew two heroic men of Moab. When it said lion-like men, it was talking about their heroicism. They were heroic men of Moab. Then killed a lion in a pit and killed an Egyptian enemy with his own spear. I can't imagine taking on feats like these. I can't imagine going up against a lion. Maybe some of you hunters in here can. I cannot. I can't imagine fighting 300 soldiers. I can't imagine standing before you and teaching God's word. What is it that God's called you to do or instructed you to do that you can't fathom yourself doing? You realize that with God, you can do so much more than kill an animal or defend a tribe or a piece of land. God has done great and mighty things through a willing person. It's all he wants, a loyal, willing person. All you have to do is have the courage to trust in the Lord and to do what he says to do. Psalms 60 and verse 12 says, Through God we shall do valiantly, for he it is that shall tread down our enemies. God's going to do it anyways. We can't do it on our own. I just told you I can't sit here, stand here, or stand there, or stand anywhere else and tell anybody about the Lord without the Lord. It's not possible. You leave it up to me, I will fail you. I will fail myself. I know me, but I put all of my trust in the Lord that he will prevail. I don't have to do it on my own, nor should we try and do it on our own. They were victorious. They were valiant, but they were victorious. Second Samuel 23 verses 9 through 12 says, And after him was Eleazar, the son of Dodo the Alhoite one of the three mighty men with David, when they defied the Philistines that were there gathered together to battle and the men of Israel were gone away, he arose and smote the Philistines 
until his hand was weary and his hand clave unto his sword and the Lord wrought a victory that day and the people returned after him only to spoil and after him was Shema the son of Agi the Herorite and the Philistines were gathered together into a troop there was a piece of ground full of lentils and the people fled from the Philistines but he stood in the midst of the ground and defended it and slew the Philistines and the Lord wrought a great victory again we see two mighty men that did mighty things for the Lord but the Bible is very clear to say they were mighty men but it was the Lord that wrought the victory it will always be the Lord that wrought the victory it will always be God that prevails he may use you and praise God that he does use men and women of God I'm so thankful that he does but it will be because he won the victory two more of David's mighty men, men mentioned here Eleazar and Shema uh, the Lord brought, brought the victory again God won the victory using these men and I'd ask you today are you willing to be used by God to win a victory a victory it's not don't think it's going to be to defend a piece of land against an army Right? But there's, there's a victory out there that's laid out for you. All you have to do is do what the Lord says to do. Just as the Lord illustrates to us here in verse 12, we too can be victorious when we're outnumbered or when we're distressed just by allowing God to work through us. When I get tired, when I get stressed out, when things just become too heavy, I just have to remember, man, God's got this anyways. God's in control. I'm just doing what he said. He's going to take care of it. And that's where we all need to be. That's a hard place to get sometimes. It goes against my flesh. It goes against everything that is me. Right? I have to do. I have to provide. I have to do. I have to. Sometimes we have to just settle down and let the Lord do. And let the Lord take care of it. Isaiah 40 Verse 31 says, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary and they shall walk and not faint. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So that was pretty much the lesson. But in conclusion, I'd just like to say that, um, you know, just like in David's day, uh, we need mighty men. We need mighty men and women, children of God, that are willing to stand and to do what the Lord instructs them to do. We also need to follow and be loyal to Jesus and at all times do everything that we can in Jesus' name. Would our pastor or our Sunday school teachers or our parents or our school teachers consider us to be mighty men? Take the time if you haven't already to answer the questions in the book. I don't know if you, has anybody done that? Has anybody read through the questions? Specifically, there's a couple there. I think there's, I don't know, eight questions or something, but specifically there's a few that I'd really like for you to pay attention to. Uh, list some of the ways in which the Lord has responded to the needs in your life. Just take a moment and think about the ways that the Lord has responded to what you needed in your life. How can you demonstrate loyalty to your leaders? How can each of us demonstrate loyalty to our leaders? How can we become more willing-hearted and wholehearted in the service of the Lord? What can we do to be more all-in for the things of God? And specifically, how do you believe the Lord would have you respond to the truths of even this lesson? If you get an opportunity this week, maybe just read through those read back through the lesson, and fill in those answers. I appreciate you being here. I appreciate those that tune in through the video. Um, I pray that, you know, everybody uh, received exactly what the Lord had in mind for you to receive. Um, the Lord really did a work on me this week with this lesson and reminded me just of how much I need to rely on him and how much I've been trying to rely on myself. It's just not sufficient. But he is. He is. Brother Darwin, would you pray for us to close us out of Sunday school?